Yesterday I played center field So I could spend some half innings alone Doubled off the Buddhist minister Knocked the tie and run home Mini Doka, bottom nine Two will count, a good lead off third Toss me something fast and low I dreamt I saw a model plane this morning Flying past the boundary road Caught the eye of Abel Grable Sliding in the second to beat the throw Flurry started and I thought of the man Who got lost from block three in the snow Blanketed in white, freezing in the night, cursing and scared, feeling foolish, dying alone. A first baseman got married, they took an army truck out to Twin Falls. They smoked their vows in a hotel suite. As a broken palm organ wheezed through the walls Little sister, butcher in the wedding march Some sweet comedy to this all Mini doll girl dressed in white Snowdrifts bounce in the moonlight As the evening took the afternoon in the count, staying alive, a thousand spectators, nothing better to do, under diamond cut stars, horizon to horizon, and a translucent milk glass moon, mini doka in the night, under diamond cut stars, horizon to horizon, and a translucent milk glass moon. Mini Doka dressed in white. Mini Doka. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the first panel of a very special day of programming that is reflecting on and celebrating the past 20 years of Minidoka. We hope that wherever you are joining us from, you and your loved ones are healthy, safe, and well. So while today is a day to look back on and truly to celebrate Minidoka's 20th anniversary, we also know that the history of the site extends back well beyond the past two decades and includes more individuals and more stories than we could ever squeeze into one day. To that end, though, we begin today with an incredibly special session to illuminate and add even more color to the histories of Minidoka. So I have the great privilege. I am Erin Aoyama. I'm a, the Programs and Research Fellow at Minidoka National Historic Site. Sorry, I forgot to begin with that. Um, but I have the great privilege of being here today with three Sansei elders, Joni, David, and Paul, who have so generously agreed to share some of their stories and memories of their lives, their childhoods at Minidoka, and afterwards. Um, so the four of us will spend the next hour or so in conversation, but if you do have questions or comments that you'd like to share with those of us on the panel or with other viewers, please leave those in the chat and we will try to answer as many questions as we can. So Joni, David, and Paul, thank you so much for being here today. I'm so excited for our conversation. Um, and I guess to get us started, David, maybe you could start and then we'll go to Joni and Paul. Um, could you just introduce yourselves, let us know where you are in the world right now, um, and where you were in 1941, 1942, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about your families before you were removed sure. and sent to the yoga. Well, maybe you could bring up the first slide and I can, I can uh, work with that. So the first slide, uh, um, I, I'm currently living in the foothills of the White Mountains of New Hampshire. And uh, for the past almost 45, 50 years, I lived in the greater Boston area where I worked. And so uh, my 
My grandfather arrived in this country in 1898, just before the turn of the century. He sent for his uh, wife, who was a picture bride in 1900. And before, in, in about 20 years, the family had grown to about nine children. And this photograph shows uh, my mom and dad living in Eatonville in a, uh, in a uh, which is a lumber town south of Tacoma. And Eatonville had a lumber mill as well as a Japanese community that was built on the grounds of, of the uh, sawmill. And uh, my father and his brothers all worked in the mill and my aunts uh, attended Eatonville High School. And it was a time of uh, family fellowship, a time, a, a happy family time where we would have picnics, Japanese uh, festivals. I remember as a young boy that since these uh, homes did not have hot running water, we would attend a Japanese bath once a week where I would go with my dad and enjoy the company of other men. In the, in the next slide, let me just uh, finish up by showing the next slide, which I attended kindergarten in Eatonville at the Eatonville Elementary School. And I'm sitting there on the right-hand side and my very best, best friend, Tommy, was on the left-hand side. We were a long time, we were good friends, we had lots of fun together. And this photograph was taken just two weeks before we were ordered to evacuate and were transported to Camp Harmony, the initial detention camp. I never did see Tommy again. So that's our, our story uh, before the war. Thanks so much, David. And Joni, maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself now and also your, your family. Thank you. Um, I'm an octogenarian, just like David and Paul. Um, I have two daughters. I have four granddaughters. And I finally got a great grandson. <laughs> but anyway, I'm living here in Portland, Oregon. And I was in Portland when the war broke out. Um, I am a late age uh, social activist and I am a volunteer and I am a speaker and a docent at, at the soon to be Japanese American Museum here in Oregon. Um, hmm. My history uh, is, are my, is my great grandparents and my grandparents who immigrated from Japan in the early 1900s. And I think my great grandfather came in the eight, late 1800s. And they, my aunt, my great aunt had told me that because of political changes that were happening in Japan and food shortages, they wanted to come to America where they felt that they could seek a better life. And they did. And they settled in Portland, Oregon. And uh, there were opportunities for them, but they faced a lot of hardships. Um, they were very enterprising people and uh, they were very industrious. And I think it took them about 30 years and two generations. And um, that art, my family, the Akamatsu Inoue family had, had helped build a Japanese community here in Portland. And it was, it's called Nihonmachi. And because of their ambition, they had built, uh, they had started a hotel, a bathhouse, a laundry, and a restaurant. And this is all done to cater to the immigrant Japanese bachelors who were coming from Japan seeking work here. These businesses were called the Mikado. And the word Mikado means emperor, and it also means greatness. And so they, they were just so, so excited to, you know, start their American dream, but it did take them a long time. And um, my great grandmother and her family had remained in Nihonmachi uh, until the war broke out in 1942, in 19, when they were evacuated in 42. But my grandfather, Inoue, had always dreamed of, of owning his own home and starting his own business. And 
because of my Nisei parents, my mother uh, was born at the Mikado Hotel, and then she married uh, my father, who was from Seattle, Washington. And because they were Niseis, um, they just, they thought, well, we can start our business now, because there was that alien long law that prohibited. Uh, people from Jap Japan to own anything. And because my grandfather was Issei, he couldn't do this. So he, because of my father and mother being Americans, they were able to apply for loans. And so they started a small business and they left Nihonmachi. And that was really brave of them to go to an all white neighborhood. And uh, it was there that I was born in that at that time. And they assimilated well until until the, until the war broke out. Thank you so much, Joni. It's amazing already to see how much how much history each of you has learned about your own family. So to round out our introductions, Paul, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your family sure. as well? Uh, our, our family, uh, both sides came originally from Hiroshima. Uh, on my mother's side, uh, my grandfather, uh, Unosuke uh, Teraoka, came to the Port of Seattle in 1902. He was a farmer, and uh, he farmed in the Auburn Kent uh, area, on, you know, uh, prior to World War II. My father's side is are uh, from uh, also Hiroshima, uh, but they're they're from a, a samurai family. And so when he came with his, he came to America because he was curious. He had read books about, you know, that America's, all the streets are paved with gold. And so he, he, he wanted to come take a look. And so he came and, and he was a butler. And, and they landed in the, the port of San Francisco in 1907. And, and so, uh, my, on my father's side, uh, the father was killed in a motorcycle accident, so mom took them back to Hiroshima. And so my father was educated early years, elementary school years in Japan. And so he's Kibe. And so, you know, he was multilingual. Well, when he returned back, the, 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 the ship that they took happened to land in Seattle. That's the only reason why we're in Seattle. And what happened was he worked... Uh, in very menial jobs there until uh, he and his brother, younger brother, Ted, uh, started a, and they took over a print shop and, and they uh, hold on a wall print shop and they uh, printed English, Japanese and Chinese. And so that was their occupation. And that was their occupation uh, uh, until the war broke out. And, but of course, in, in, if you lived in the city in Seattle, of course you lived in the ghetto. We were not allowed to live in, in white neighborhoods at all. So mm -hmm. as a result, there is a certain square square area, miles, where most all the Japanese lived. Mm -hmm. And so we lived there. Uh, the nice thing, of course, is that we knew every Japanese, just about every Japanese American in the area. And, of course, a lot of those in the farm areas would come into the city. And, yes, I used to love on Friday nights, my father would take us to Ofuro and to the bathhouse and so forth. And it was great. And, and, you know, and of course we all lived in the ghetto. Uh, and uh, prior, just prior to we being uh, sent to uh, uh, Puyallup Assembly Center, Camp Harmony, is that of course we were all assigned family numbers. And my father's and my family, and my uncle's family uh, were only one number off. In other words, they went together. And it's 11940. And to tell you the truth, I didn't even know that number until in the late 1990s, in the process of cleaning my fa father's house to sell, mm -hmm. I found all these artifacts all over the place. You know, I mean, and, and, and I, I guess it was important enough for them to drag it with them wherever they went. You know, from before the war to to Assembly Center to Minidoka to Washington D.C. back to uh, Seattle. So that's our history prior to World War II. Wow. 
Thank you so much for sharing that. It's amazing. And we will get to those artifacts, I think, too, a little bit later on, Paul. Um, but I want to ask, you know, we got right up to the beginning of the war and, and the process of removal. So I'm wondering, I know each of you was pretty young when this happened, but what memories do you have? Maybe we'll start again with you, David. Um, what memories do you have of those first few days after Pearl Harbor and the sort of process leading up to being removed and sent to an assembly center? Mm hmm. Well, uh, let's uh, take a look at the next slide, slide number uh, three, and uh, a, a little backstory. M my dad was loved to write and write stories, and he made arrangements with the editor of the Eatonville Dispatch, the, the local newspaper, that he would start writing dispatches from the camp describing the experiences of the family. And much to the credit of the editor of the newspaper, uh, he, the, uh, his, uh, my father's stories and dispatches would be published so everybody in the uh, community could read about our adventures, if you will, at, uh, during the evacuation. So um, I was about, I was six years old at the time. And being a six year old, it's difficult to remember uh, what it was like, but I do remember uh, filling up my mattress cover uh, with with straw and finding uh, room for my bed in the corner of a horse stall. And I think about it now, some almost 80 years ago, and think about my grandson who was six years old and what what he would remember about the event. And what what I do remember is my brother. Uh, who is next to me, he was only uh, two and a half years old, he would cry incessantly. He could not be consoled by my mother. Uh, I can still see her sitting in the shadow, deep shadows of the uh, horse stall, and he would cry hour after hour until there, was no, there were no tears left. And all I could hear was uh, his struggle for breathing, and this low animal guttural sound that was just the remains of his crying. And I think that for children of that age and uh, younger, the, the camp experience has had a long lasting impact on, on us. Um, I can't imagine uh, a government that would allow six-year-olds to fill mattress covers with straw and put them into horse stables. And I, even now I question what kind of government was this that did it to children, elderly and adults? Thank you, David, thanks for sharing that. Um, Joni, how about you? Those, those days after the attack on Pearl Harbor and, and being removed from your home and your neighborhood, what sort of memories or stories do you have from that time? Well, I really don't have memories, but I was only three and a half years old, but my memories are really, I think my parents' anecdotal stories that they told to me as I grew up. And so before, you be, so your parents' memories become kind of your memories, I think. Um, anyway, uh, my parents had told me many stories over and over again. Um, in when uh, World War II began, I was three and a half years old, and um, I had an experience that I don't remember, but my mother and father and my aunts, everyone told me this. Um, the FBI had come to our home. Now, my grand, as you, as I had said earlier, we all lived in Southeast Portland um, together. My grandparents, my uncle, and my and I did, and my Jichan, who was my grandfather, um, had been in America for over thirty-five years, and he spoke broken English. He was an alien, and of course, he was denied citizenship. He had no ties to Japan, but because he was a man of faith, he belonged to this Konko Church, which is kind of like an offshoot of the Shinto faith. Um, they probably thought of him as having a little bit of uh, suspect. They thought of him as a suspect. 
And the uh, just earlier, the Shinto priest, I mean, the Konko priest had been arrested and he had been taken to a, a prisoner camp. And so they came to our home to search and seize if there was any contraband in our house. And um, they took away my grandfather's reading books, his prayer book, and they all, because it was all written in Japanese, and then they took away my father's uh, camera and his binoculars. And then they asked every member of our family if there were any guns in the house. And of course they denied, they said, no, we have no guns. But little Joni, three and a half year old Joni said, yes, we have a gun. <laughs> and my mother was really aghast at this whole conversation. And she kept looking at me and saying, no, no. And I said, and so the FBI agent had taken me aside and said, where is the gun? Where are your guns? And I said, upstairs. And I took them to the attic they opened up a, and I pointed to a trunk and they opened up the trunk and inside was a gun, but it was a toy gun. It had one, it was a little cap pistol that once belonged to my uncle Jerry Inoue. So that just shows the foolishness of that time. And of course there was embarrassment and, and there was real, there was sighs of relief from my mom and dad. Um, the government, moved awfully fast. Um, we had executive order 9066. Um, people were being arrested um, and the government said, okay, you got to get out of here. We're going to take you away. And so just with within seven to 10 days, we had to just give up everything. We had to sell, pack, the grocery business was sold for pennies on the dollar. And we, uh, and with only what we could carry, we were imprisoned with 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry living on the West Coast because they all look like us, <laughs> because we were the enemy. In May of 1944, um, my family and I spent four months at the Pacific International Livestock Center. But unlike Paul, I had to remember my family number. I was so little, but that number was very important for my mom. She felt that I had, I remember the tag that was hanging on my, on my little shirt that day. But my mother was so worried that, cause there were about 3000 of us in this, in this exhibition center and she thought, oh, I'm gonna get lost. So he had made me memorize 15259 and that number stayed with me all these years. It was a number that was just embedded. I knew that number probably more than my name. <laughs> um, but we lived in convert converted stalls. And of course these stalls had once housed animals and there was stanch and there was hanging fly paper. And we all shared, I think all of us had experienced something very similar. We had no privacy and we had no freedom. And of course, it was a great dehumanization of its citizens. But I think that assembly center that we lived in had prepared my family um, for life that would be much more devastating to them and uncertainty in the days that were to follow. Thank you so much for sharing that, Joni. Um, Paul, I know you were also Hi. quite young. <laughs> Hi. Oh, yes. Um, uh -huh. But what, you know, okay. what memories or stories and, and maybe leading up to going to Minidoka, leaving okay. the Assembly Center as okay. well? Okay, uh, Aaron. Uh, but just before I start, David, um, today in, in the small museum at, in Puyallup, you know, where the Assembly Center was, they uh -huh. actually have a hands on exhibit where what you do is get this small bag and they have straw there and you stuff it in there and it's actually <laughs> it, yes yes uh, that's what when you mentioned that i i started laughing because uh, they have that as a hands-on exhibit to show the public what you know what what we all went through and they actually right. let you know even little children to adults stuff and then you know, kind of <laughs> lean on it to kind of give them the idea of, you know, what it was really like. But, okay, yeah. so in, in, in our situation, of course, 
uh, the, you know, I was asthmatic and, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, before uh, the assembly center, uh, I'm like Joni, I don't remember a thing about it, uh, not a thing. So going to Minidoka, I didn't start mem remembering anything until I was in Minidoka. But the one thing that I, a couple of things I remember was uh, the dust, of course. The, during, you know, and it blew in, in the high desert, 4,000 4, you know, feet, sagebrush and dust. Well, when the bulldozers came to clear the area to put the barracks in, all they left uh, exposed was dust. And so what happened was, I remember my mom, uh, uh, before we would all go to sleep, she would go to the main spigot, get a bucket of water, bring it back to the house, I mean, to the barracks where we were, strip newspaper into long strips, soak it in the, the, the bucket, and wherever the biggest holes that she could see from the light coming from the outside to it, she would plaster it. She would plaster those biggest holes, except that, of course, there were more holes than there was newspaper. And, of course, by the time the next morning and we got up, of course, all you had to do is touch your face. Anything that was exposed, it's like talcum powder. It was that fine. And there was dust wherever it is, in your nose, in your mouth, in your ears, wherever it is. And and I remember, you know, uh, and, and you think about it, and it was futile, but that's all she had. And so that's what she had to do. And she did it, you know, every day every before we went to sleep. And she would plaster it on there, you know. And, of course, you know, evaporation, everything falls. And so by morning, you know, we were covered with it anyway. But... Uh, another thing that on our way out, because my father was a printer, you know, and 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 the, our, our country needed, you know, specialists for the war effort. And and my father, again, was a printer and my uncle were printers, English, Japanese and Chinese. And so uh, they they both applied to the federal government because, of course, my father wanted me to get me out of there because he knew I was going to die. If I stayed for the duration, I would have died there. So what happened was, it, even at that, it took 11 months for him to get okay. And do you know what agency, federal agency, he, he ended up working for? OSS, Secret Service, CIA today. Okay? You know, and I understand that that was the highest uh, security, you know, clearance that you had to go through. And it's, isn't it ironic, while, while my father and I and my and grandma and everybody is sitting in uh, Minidoka, you know, behind barbed wire, my father actually passed their most stringent. So after 11 months in Minidoka, we got out. And, and we eventually ended up in, in D.C. We lived in Arlington, Virginia, and where all the other families, you know, of, of the specialists that were recruited. Uh, lived and and he commuted by bus to DC, but the interesting that the negative part was, again, my grandma came to America in 1907, San Francisco. She was never allowed to become a citizen until 52. So of course, in in uh, in 43, uh, when we were allowed, and we all had to go through security, you know, it, it, at the, uh, Minidoka through the WRA. What happened was. Uh, uh, we all passed, of course. Grandma could not come with us because why? She was an alien. Well, America didn't allow her to. And by the way, she was bilingual. You know, she was a very smart woman. She worked for a white family. And so way before 1941, she was bilingual. She could, she could uh, read and write English. Well, the thing here is because she was an alien, she had to stay there. And she was there from uh, August 1942 till October of 1945. You know, three years plus, okay? And she was stuck there, and her only crime was she was an alien. Well, they wouldn't let her become an American citizen, you know? And those are the two memories I, I remember most about. Thank you so much, Paul. So. 
it, let's talk a little bit more about Minidoka um, as well and your time there. So, David, maybe you could tell us a little bit, what are some memories that you have of being at Minidoka and maybe specifically about your family and your, your parents too? Well, let's, uh, let's take a look at the next slide. And uh, I have to give attribution to this photograph, which shows myself in the background and my two brothers, Jerry, who is now about uh, almost three years old, and Chester Jr., who is about uh, one and a half years old. This photograph was taken by a WRA photograph, and it's now housed in the Bancroft Muse uh, collection at the University of California. So I want to give attribution to the source of this photograph. But we were uh, transported by train in September of 1942 uh, to Minidoka. The train ride took about 30 hours. And what I remember most is the, is the fact that the blinds of the train were, were train cars were pulled down so we could not see out nor could people from the outside see in. But I remember one evening, early in the evening, somewhere in the high desert in Idaho, I peeked out the window and I can still remember the smell of the cool desert air, uh, the smell of the smoke from the train engineer engine uh, in the cars far ahead of us. And I saw a lone figure of a man watching us as we were transported across the desert to Minidoka. This photograph was taken uh, as we arrived. And I remember getting off the train and greeted by a armed guard. I can still remember his uniform, his rifle. And he looked at me and he said, hi, David. And I was befuddled. I could not understand how he knew my name. And like Joni indicated, we all had name tags, and he was able to uh, to uh, read my name off the name tag. In the next slide, uh, in 1943, uh, shortly after uh, we arrived, uh, within six months, a call came out for volunteers to to volunteer into the U.S. Army, and my father and his three brothers all volunteered into the uh, to serve in the U.S. Army. This photograph is a photograph of my father who returned from basic training in Camp Shelby. And uh, I, I recall his coming back and his, uh, this photograph was taken by an illicit camera because most of the internees in the camps were not allowed uh, a camera. But my mother, prior to my father leaving, begged him not to volunteer and serve in the U.S. Army and leave her alone with uh, three very rambunctious boys. She said to my father, you're 38 years old. You're twice the age of most draftees. You don't have to go. But my father, being the patriot that he was, uh, said he had to go. And from that point on, I didn't see him until the end of the war, but only on occasion. But before he left, he turned to me and I recall vividly how he said, now, David, who I was seven years of age, you're the man of the house. And I took that quite literally. And at that point, as I look back at it now, I turned from a seven-year-old to an adult because my father said I was the head of the household. A, a, an impossible task for a seven-year-old, the same age as my, my seven-year-old grandson. My mother struggled with, with trying to raise the family. And in the next pho photograph, this photograph shows the family unit sitting on a rock pile and you can see the barracks in the background. And this, this photograph really touches me because it shows my mother struggling to maintain a normal household. We were wearing hand-me-down clothes. And Paul, you notice the dust on the shoes. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, yeah. She, she tried to 
try to maintain a semblance. And during this time, I could see my mother beginning to fade, and she was soon overcome by the stress of managing uh, the, the three boys. And in fact, one at one time, she was hospitalized for what's quoted as exhaustion because it was so difficult managing uh, the, the three boys. But she did take us on uh, picnics to the perimeter where we had picnics under the shade of the uh, watchtower. She even took us on a vacation once to uh, Ogden, Utah for to view the Golden Spike. Uh, and I still don't understand what, uh, what she had an interest in, why she had an interest in the Golden Spike. My youngest, my younger brother, Jerry, on the right-hand side was a real handful. Many of the barracks had dug cesspools or drainage holes underneath the barracks. And my brother, Jerry, would run relatively unfettered from barracks to barracks. And I remember him coming home one day. He had fallen into a neighbor's cesspool and had pulled himself out, came home, and he was dripping with this most unimaginable slimy material that he had picked up yeah. in that cesspool. In the next photograph, we had the opportunity to go on vacation. And the, uh, we, we uh, uh, were able to go to a vacation Bible camp in the foothills of uh, of um, Idaho in Sun Valley. And you can see my t-shirt saying Camp Shelby. And I remember my father was at the time in basic training and had sent me a commemorative t-shirt showing Camp Shelby located in Mississippi. Uh, the young, the boy sitting next to me or standing next to me is uh, uh, Brooks Andrews whose father was the reverend of the Japanese Baptist Church. And the, the uh, Emory Andrews and his family, including his son Brooks, uh, had come with his parish to Minidoka to serve his parishioners. Um, and so there are a lot of ironies uh, living in Minidoka, uh, going on vacation, going to see the Golden Spike. Uh, but I think I just recalled a story that just came to mind recently. Uh, the camp, associate camp director was a man by the name of Eugene Davidson. And I recall one day the uh, Eugene Davidson's wife invited us up for a play date to have a play date with his daughter, Betsy Davidson. And I can still remember that play date. We were playing outside the barracks, and she had a, uh, a head full of curly blonde hair, and it was a wonderful time. It gave us a sense of normalcy having this play date. So that was life in, 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 uh, in Minidoka. And my father, in the meantime, had, had uh, gone on to uh, work with the MIS, in St. Paul, and we then subsequently were allowed to leave, but that's another story. Thank you so much, David. And I know- Oh, I, sh I, oh, go ahead. I should add, Paul, I yes. love the story of the, of the wet newspapers because instead of hanging wet newspapers on, on the wall and on the ceiling, we used yes. to rip up newspaper, wet it, and throw it on the floor and sweep up the dust with the wet newspapers. Yeah. And only yeah. recently, within the last yeah. month, I was looking at my garage floor and it was filled with all the debris from the winter salt and sand. And I yeah. thought maybe I should take newspaper and throw it on the floor like we used to do in Minidoka and clean up yeah. my garage floor with wet newspaper. Yeah. But Oh, by the way, David, uh, Brooks Andrews, uh, he yes. and I are very good friends, and yeah. he, he used to come to the uh, 
uh, Minidoka pilgrimages every year, and and he would be the ministerial representative. I haven't seen right. him lately, but but again, oh yeah, yeah. He's, he's as far as I know, he's still alive and kicking. So uh, yes, he's a he's a very good friend of mine. Well, his father, as I mentioned, was the uh, the pastor of the Japanese Baptist Church. Yes, and yes. one of my one of the reasons my grandfather migrated to the U.S. was. As a young man, he converted to Christianity, and he wanted to practice his Christian religion here in the United States. And uh, he was, when he arrived in Seattle, he was the, one of the founding members of the Japanese Baptist Church, which is located down near uh, Jackson Street. And his name is still on the cornerstone of the, uh, of the church. Yeah. Reverend Andrews is, is universally you know, admired and loved by all the Japanese because what he did was, even though he was a Baptist minister, he would drive his truck back and forth from Seattle to the camp. And, and mm -hmm. you're talking 600 miles one way. And he would, yes. he would bring stuff the, mm -hmm. for, for, uh, for Christians and non-Christian Japanese Americans. Mm -hmm. And he did the entire mm -hmm. war and he was harassed and threatened with his life by the whites in Twin Falls, yes. the, the nearest town, right. and for that, yep. and they would be kicked out of housing and things like that. And and Reverend Andrews, I mean, literally, he gave his life to uh, to us, to our, you know, to Japanese right. Americans. Oh you know, yeah, he's a great person, but great there, person. There, there were other religious leaders who accompanied the uh, the internees to Minidoka, uh, Buddhist mm -hmm. and Shinto priests. And I, yes. I remember specifically Father Tibisar, a Catholic priest who uh, ministered to his flock and uh, was very much involved with uh, serving those Catholic members of his parish at Minidoka. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It's so, I mean, to hear you talk about David going on vacation and having play dates in the context of being incarcerated at this camp, it's that irony, but still these moments of joy and hope also encapsulated by, you know, these religious folks that you've mentioned, um, who stood by and, and tried to support and serve Japanese Americans as best they could. I think hearing these stories is so powerful because it just shows how complex a lot of this history is and what happens when you're focusing on individuals. Um, but Joni, I know we've heard some really wonderful stories from <laughs> you in the lead up to to today about your childhood in camp and your memories of your of your family so would you share some of what you remember about Minidoka? yeah i'd be glad to um when uh i have some very clear memories um one of them of course was when we first got to camp and we were on a train like david and paul and the blinds were down and when we got off that train, I remember very clearly that dust storm. It was it was horrific. We arrived in September of 42, and mm. um, it was probably one of the worst sandstorms they ever had. But my mom had covered my face, protect, trying to pr protect me from the stinging sand that was blowing around. And she covered my face very tightly. And she said to me, and she was crying, my mother was crying, and she said to me, Joni, this is our, our new home. This is where we're going to live. You know, I think back about that time and I thought, wow, that must have been really awful. You know, they were so far away from that north, this beautiful Northwest greenery that we had. And here we are, are out in the sagebrush desert. Um, like Paul, I and David, the sand was pretty horrific in Minidoka. And um, my mother, my memories of that is my mother having a broom in her hand. It seemed like she was always sweeping the floors. You know, our barracks were uninsulated and they were very thin and there were holes. Um, I don't remember the wet newspaper, but I do remember <laughs> my mother's broom and going. And I remember the sand being in my hair. We'd go out. You know, we used to st stand in line to for everything. We had to stand in line to eat, uh, to use uh, the showers, to wash our clothes. And that every time we were out there, no sooner did you eat or bathe that you would have sand back in your hair or face again. Um, 
the one thing about that area that was not very pleasant was the rain. I hated the rain because whenever it rained, there was always flood. And when there was flood, you would slip and fall because we didn't have sidewalks. And we would have these two by fours. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. That would mm -hmm. take us from point A to point B. And mm -hmm. I invariably, I could never balance on those. And I could, I remember falling and flipping. So I hated that, that awful weather. Um, I'm going to have, there's a picture of uh, my brother and me in camp. There I am with my little brother. He was a about maybe a year old and um like you know we it was uh illegal to have our own cameras but somebody came by and took pictures of of us and that is a, a memory there mm -hmm. <laughs> um, i had been told that i was a little chatterbox and my uh, everyone that knew me in camp said oh Joni, you just loved it go and talk to people all the time. And and my mom and dad had given me freedom uh, to go out and visit family and friends who lived on other blocks. So I had, I would go out, I don't know not if I was daily, but I would go out a lot. And when I did, I would come back to the camps, to my barrack, and it was dinner time, and I was never able to eat dinner. And so my father and mother said to me, why are you, why, why don't you want to eat? And I said, well, because I got this and I would show them pieces of candy or something. And I had been eating all these snacks. So my father had made me a sign. It was a red, oh. white, and blue sign. And I had to hang this sign on my neck whenever I left the barrack. Mm -hmm. And the sign read, please do not feed me. <laughs> anyway that was a fun thing um there's also a picture of that means a lot to me and it's a picture of my dad and me um we're in front of our barrack and if you look behind those are vegetables growing and we had mm -hmm. planted seeds in the in the ground, uh, this and and then the and the seeds grew into vegetables. This was our victory garden. It was right behind our barrack. At that time, um, there was a shortage of vegetables, and all Americans were encouraged to grow their own as part of the war effort. And we Americans, even though we were in concentration camps, we did the very same thing. So we were so proud of our vegetable garden. I also, um, my dad was very creative and um, he learned to become an electrician and he was so good at doing this that he became the camp's chief electrician. Mm -hmm. And he went to the library and he studied, you know, how to do this and that. But he had also did something for our family that was really, I wish I still had that. He made a radio for us. He had taken an old orange crate and he had put radio tubes inside of the box and then he cut a round hole and the round hole was covered with chicken wire. And so he, so we had a radio, but we could not have the volume turned up. Well, I don't even know if we had knobs to do this, but we had to put blankets around our head. And I remember at night, it was so much fun because we got to cover our heads with blankets and we had got our ears really close to the speakers and we could hear music. And that, and I just loved hearing all those old songs, Mersey Oats and Dozy Oats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Don't Fence Me In. <laughs> anyway, those are songs from that time. And of course, my mom and dad loved it because they could hear the news of the outside world. So all was not bad. We we didn't go on any outside trips like you did, David. But I think my mom and dad try to make the best of the situation by making, um, you know, by having fun things for us to do. But they never complained. And they had that gaman. Um, I think all of our parents did. All of our parents and grandparents they endured and they wanted to protect us 
and they never spoke to us about that dark part of their history. Thanks, Joni. And we do have a question, a quick question from the audience. It's related um, from Neil, who says, Joni, a practical question. How did your mother keep up with your baby brother's diapers? Which is maybe <laughs> not a question you have an answer to, but I think is something to, yeah, think about oh, and kind of wonder. Like a body. Okay. How did she keep up? I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. When Neil is a good friend of, I think of, my, of our families, uh, they were very long time old friends, our family friends. Um, gosh, I know my brother was a little wild boy and I'm sure those diapers were always having to be changed. Yeah. She probably had a hard time getting out there, but you know, again, she had to probably get it, we had to get into lines for everything, for washing diapers, for bathing. Um, I remember my mom always wanting to rush us to, mm -hmm. to bathe because if we went mm -hmm. too late, there was never hot water for us. Mm -hmm. So we would have to kind of get ourselves going early to get into the line mm -hmm. for our showers. <laughs> I, uh, Joni, I, I think that, uh, first of all, there was a... Uh, shortage of hot water. And in fact, I read someplace that there was no hot water until almost Thanksgiving. And both you and I arrived in September yeah. and we had to survive without hot water for at least two to three months. But speaking of hot water, there was a wash house and there were no washing machines at the time. Yeah, that's right. And uh, yeah. there was a, a washboard right. and Fells yeah. Nanfa soap. Yeah. And that was it in terms of cleaning the oh, yeah. diapers, washing the diapers, and then hanging them out to air dry on the line behind the barracks. And dust, and the dust on that. And dust. Yes, yeah. 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 yeah, there was yeah. there was no such thing as disposable diapers. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, Paul, I know you shared a little bit about some of your memories from Minidoka, but uh, any other sort of memories of being a child in camp um, yes. or of your family? Yeah, I, I, I remember like for instance, that uh, an incident where I and, and a few of my friends uh, walked up to the uh, fence. And in Minidoka, mm -hmm. uh, to us, of course, as children, we thought the fence was really high and in actuality, the, scent, the fence was only six feet high. Most of the other camps, they were eight, 10, you know, whatever it is. But ours was only six feet high. And I remember uh, looking through the, the fence and, and the white, the young white soldiers, you know, the, the guards that were walking on the other side of this fence. Uh, we would sit there and we would talk with them. And from what I understand, it was, that century, that duty at Minidoka was the most boring uh, duty you could have. Mm -hmm. And, but I remember that, well, I, you know, as I got older and I read about that is, is about any of the camps is that technically, if the soldier on the other side thought you were trying to escape, they had the right to shoot you, you know? And, and, but as, as a, uh, what, four or five year old, by that time, I remember looking up at them, at the guards, and we, and we were just chit chatting, you know, just mm -hmm. chit chatting. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, without with the realization that hey, you know, if he was in a bad mood, mm -hmm. he could shoot us because as you know, in all the, the 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 shootings at all the camps during World War II, and all the people Japanese Americans that were killed, none of the guards were ever prosecuted, none. Zero, you know, and 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 that was you know a reality there, but I think also too is Aaron, um, you know our, our exit my exit card the indefinite yeah. leave card, yeah. if you look at the picture, okay, my face, is that uh, maybe you could show it? Sure, yeah, we'll we'll pull that up. There okay, we go. okay, zero in on the face, and and. and the face, the expression on my face, see, if you can tell, that's not a happy camper, okay? And it was interesting. The reason that I was uh, uh, in uh, the, you know, I think uh, the 50 objects, you know, uh, uh, CEO by uh, Nancy Ukai, the reason she wanted to use my uh, uh, indefinite leave card was the expression on my face. <laughs> 
See, uh, white America wanted to give the public, the uh, population, the idea that our camps were summer camps and that everybody was happy and, you know, there was no problems. And, and we gladly went to these camps. Well, uh, Nancy uh, saw the expression on my face from that card. And she said, hey, I got to have that to show what it really was, you know, the really uh, real effects of of uh, imprisonment, you know, from children all the way through the, the grandparents. And as you can tell there, again, uh, she said, I've got to have that. And that's why she used that uh, the photo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, an expressive face. It your face says a lot in that photo, definitely. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, definitely. You know, I knew enough to realize. You know, I don't like it here. Why? <laughs> what? Let's go home, huh? Let's go back to Seattle, okay? And 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 my parents, of course. And you don't. You don't. Uh, uh, we just can't leave because we want to leave. You know. The the uh, the WRA the white man has will they tell they tell us when we to eat what time to get up what time to do everything and if we do not comply they they transfer the family to Tule Lake mm -hmm. you know which by the way mm -hmm. I have a rel a relative my mother's eldest sister uh, Eiko who who essentially and she was four feet something and she says to the FBI who do, you know you can't do this to me. You can't send me to any of these camps and so forth. I'm an American citizen. I was born in Thomas, Washington, you know, and you can't do this to me. You know what happened to her and her family? Absolutely. They were, they were transferred from Minidoka to uh, Tule Lake and they spent the duration of the war at Tule Lake. So yeah. if you complained, you paid. You know, Paul, Paul, I know that your card, your exit card was on July 4th. Yes. Independence July, Day, by the way, folks. Independence. Yeah. Yeah. They, they let us out of the camp on Independence Day, July 4th, 1943. Yes. Paul, I uh, I noted your fingerprint. And yes. I, re I remember when the FBI fingerprinted me. And I think ah. even today, yes. what right? Does the U.S. government have to fingerprint U.S. citizens and put them yes. on a record? Uh, I, I think yes. this is such an affront to our, yes. our citizenship. Uh, and yes. we were only yes. children. We were six years old yes. at the time. Yes. Right. And they Mom. fingerprinted everybody, yeah. everybody, everybody, from right. infants to grandma. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Yeah. 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 I have a card also, and my little brother, who was just a year old the d when we left camp, there's my fingerprint right there, and there's my exit card, yeah. but I was smiling. <laughs> I yeah. left, I left um, four, five days before, after you, Paul. I just noticed that. I really haven't. A year, la a year later, though. Yeah. Uh, no, it's 1944. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Paul left in 43. Um, yeah. yeah, so it was, yeah, I, I just think of the great injustice of those cards and fingerprinting us like we were criminals and we, we were American citizens. But also interesting about those cards is they were indefinite leave cards saying that if the government could call us back at any time, they could let us yes. go, but they yes, could... They could have us come back again. Right. Yeah. Yes. They did control our lives. Right. Yes, they did. Yeah. In in the camps and even after we were released, right. they controlled our lives. Right. Yes. Which is the perfect segue here. I wanted to ask about what you remember with leaving leaving camp. How did you leave camp? I know, Paul, you shared a little bit of that. But for each of you, where you went or your families went after camp and just what those years were like going back back to the world after Minidoka. David, maybe mm. we can start with you. When when, and sure. how did your family leave Minidoka and what, what do you remember uh, those years after? At, at about the same time as Joni in, in the summer of 1944, uh, if you show the first, the, the next photograph, let's see, in the next photograph, yeah. Uh, we were, we left in the summer of 1944 
and under the auspices of the uh, American Home Baptist Mission. And we were sponsored by a socialist farmer in Wisconsin. And uh, the story goes, and I don't recall it, is that my mother took the three boys in route on a troop train and had gotten off the train in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and was getting sandwiches for, for the family. When she suddenly realized that the train was leaving the station, she grabbed the three boys and ran desperately down the platform and managed to get back onto the train. And I, I think about the, the, the tragedy it would have happened if she were abandoned in Cheyenne, Wyoming, with all her suitcases going eastbound, and she was there standing in the middle of the night in Cheyenne, Wyoming. But fast forward, we, we stayed briefly with the uh, socialist farmer in Good Earth, uh, Wisconsin, but then found the situation intolerable and were then placed into a one-room studio apartment in downtown Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, the, the studio apartment wasn't much bigger than the room we had at the barracks at uh, 158E, but uh, a, a year later, we were then admitted into public housing, a park lawn public housing, which was the showcase of Frank Zeidler, who was the last socialist mayor in the United States. And there we, uh, my father came home from the war. We entered elementary school and uh, began our climb up the social economic ladder. Thanks, David. And Joni, where did your family go when you left Minidoka? We went to Chicago. Um, my father, I, uh, the WRA, the War Re Re Relocation Authority, had a, had allowed some of us to leave, and my father had work that was promised to him. He applied as a for a washing machine repairman. I think my dad kind of lied about this. <laughs> he did not know anything about washing machine repairs, but he was clever. He was he had a mechanical mind, and he knew that we had to get out of camp. So we all went there, um, and we lived in a cold water flat. My father worked for a very kind Jewish man, and this mm -hmm. man had found a little apartment for us, and that was our first apartment, was living in this cold water flat. Uh, but it was much better than living in that uninsulated barrack in Minidoka. And um, we finally moved into a brownstone apartment with three bedrooms a little later. I loved school and I loved being with all these different ethnicities. Um, all of a sudden I was away from all the Japanese kids and I was with brown and black and white kids. It was pretty exciting for me. But that was not an easy time for me because that was when all of a sudden I realized that I was their enemy. I, the war had, was still going on and there was hatred, words that were thrown at me that I had never heard before. Um, I was called Jap. I didn't know what that meant. I was called Tojo and I didn't know who that man was. Um, Anyway, um, I was bullied and I was chased and I felt kind of ashamed to be Japanese. And I, I, I wanted, I remember asking my mom if we can go back to that camp that we lived in before. Oh. I felt mm -hmm. safe there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, mm -hmm. um, it was interesting. Um, you know, Tojo, of course, was the general who... Um, was responsible for the attack on Pearl Harbor. So he really was the enemy. Um, anyway, my m parents had worried about my safety. And um, when we, we had the opportunity to come back to Portland um, for a visit in 1947, and um, there I met my great aunt and uncle, and they said, why don't you send Joni out to live with us? Hmm. Um, so that was an opportunity for my mom and dad to feel I had more safety there because they had to still stay in Chicago. By then they had started a little grocery business. And so I went to a, a small um, school and it was an all white school. I was a minority and it was in Tillamook, Oregon. 
and mm -hmm. it was a novelty. And that very first day of school, the principal put me on the stage and he said, I want to introduce you to Joni Nakayama, a little Jap girl. <laughs> so I, I was a novelty in the school and kids would touch my hair and my face. I looked so different from the blonde and the blue eyed kids. And um, they asked me what kind of food I ate that made my hair so black. In those days I had black hair. <laughs> And um, they said, do you eat with a fork? And I said, yeah, I eat with a fork. I'm an American, just like you. But anyway, those were my early years after Minidoka. Um, and they were years of kind of being like the other. Thank you so much for sharing, Joni. And Paul, what was your life like in, in DC or in the DC area after? Yeah, you, you know, after being released on July 4th, Independence Day 43, we first were, went, went to Denver because they had to process the paperwork. Then we took a train from Denver all the way across the country to Washington, D.C. We lived in housing provided by federal uh, families of federal employees uh, in Arlington, Virginia. My father commuted back and forth. And, and so the last two years of the war until the end of the war, uh, that's where we lived. But the interesting part there was, see, this was the East Coast. It's not the West Coast. The The enemy for most Americans on the East Coast were the Germans, the U-boats, you know, the submarines. They, they were, you know, sinking a lot of the, the supply ships that, you know, that we were sending to particularly England, you know, to, to help them. And what happened was, and so the, the, the main enemy were... Uh, and so when we were there, and there were very few Japanese there anyway, even before the war. And so what happened was um, they just looked at us, okay? And and I don't I don't uh, recall. And see, by that time I was like six, seven years old. I I don't recall any kind of you know discrimination against us. Although there was one incident when we first got there is that on the weekend uh, we took the bus from Arlington. And it was a project kind of, you know, you live in a project, but it was a nice project. We took a bus into D.C. We saw all this, you know, the sites, you know, the monuments and so forth. On the way back, when we hit the the uh, uh, the Virginia state border, the bus stopped. The large white bus driver turned around and looked toward the back. And he said, all coloreds to the back of the bus. Hmm. We didn't know what coloreds meant, okay? And I mean, I remember all of us looked at each other. We were petrified. We happened to be sitting in the front. See, because in D.C., you can't discriminate, all right? And, and so there we were going into Virginia, a southern state, okay? And even though it was just right across the Potomac. And so what happened was he said all coloreds to the back of the bus. And and of course, being nice, obedient Japanese Americans, we we play safe, and we started. The five of us started going toward the back of the bus. The white bus driver said, "No, no, not you, folks. You stay. You can sit where you are. You stay where you are." The African Americans meant if that was colored then, and they did have to go to the back of the bus because you were now in Virginia. You were not in D.C. And that that but that the when that came up, that scared. I mean, that gave me nightmares for years because, I mean, we were like looking at each other and says, what's a colored? You know, what is that? And so actually in our situation, being on the East Coast, we were treated better than when, when after the war and we came back to Seattle, we were treated worse than it. We should have stayed. And in fact, as I have read in some books, a, a lot of reasons why almost half of Japanese Americans after camp went east to Chicago and the east is because we were treated better there than if we went back to the homes that we came from originally. You know, that we were we were born and raised in. We were treated worse on the West Coast. And I think a lot of them uh, had read many, you know, uh, testimonials and, and they said, hey, uh, if, you know, if I were a pharmacist before the war, 
And if I wanted a pharmacist job uh, after the war, I had to go east hmm. because if I went back to Seattle, they may not hire me as a uh, pharmacist right. because they look they look at our face and they say, uh uh-uh, uh, uh uh, right. even though we were totally exonerated, even though none of us were ever convicted of espionage or treason against America, you know, is, hey, it was worse from what my father was saying, because I I don't remember prior to the war. My father said it was worse when we got back. It took years for us to be even able to do what we did before the war. Anyway, that's my pitch. (laughs) Yeah, thank you for sharing that story, Paul. Huh? Thank you yeah. for sharing that. Yeah, it's and I'm just looking at the time and I know we the four of us could talk for for hours. But I, I want to ask because I know each of you has such a unique story. But I want to ask about when you started sharing these stories and these memories. And if you ever talked with your parents about that or what sort of got you started um, to do these kinds of events, because all of you have have spoken about your experiences in, in other formats. Um, so, David, maybe we can start with you. Um, we'll stick with our same order of, you know, did you talk with your parents? Did you talk with your father about your memories from camp um, after the mm-hmm. war? And then when did you start sharing these stories with a broader audience? Well, <clears throat> Karen, I, I think we need another hour if you want to go into that. <laughs> but um, well, first of all, my, I, I can't ever recall speaking with my dad about his experiences. It was as it was this as if there was a wall of silence, and my mother never spoke about it. Although I think she bore the scars of the internment experience, uh, she if you look at pre World War II movies and you see a young, vivacious, uh, young woman, young family, and then I what I can remember now is after the war, she had changed uh, significantly. So the the war had a a very uh, uh, serious impact on her outlook. Um, In the late 1970s, some of the Sanseis on the West Coast and others began to push for redress. And living in Boston, uh, we didn't have a large uh, uh, Nikkei population but there was a small group of us that put together the Japanese Americans of New England. We were called Jane, which then changed into, in, uh, into the New England chapter of the JACL. And uh, although we didn't have uh, an opportunity to bring witnesses to the Presidential Commission on wartime internment, uh, we had uh, good friends on the uh, faculty at Harvard and Harvard did invite the commission to uh, hold hearings on the economic, psychological, and other impacts of the uh, of the internment. We had speakers like uh, Alan Dershowitz and uh, Alan uh, Alan Tr- uh, Lawrence Tribe speaking on the constitutional issues, which we thought was an important element of the discussion. So in the early 1980s, I began speaking on the internment and on our, our uh, experiences. And personally, it was uh, very difficult to bring back those memories. And, but over the years, I, I became more comfortable with the story. And since the 1980s, which is now almost uh, 40 years, I've spoken to a variety of groups here largely on the East Coast, from Harvard to high schools, to uh, law, the law school at Boston College, to elite private schools like Phillips Exeter. Um, and I think about why I do this. And, and the reason is that this message, this story is so important that uh, this message, and especially since because of who we are, we're the last of the survivors uh, of the internment. And when I began giving my talk, I was quite optimistic that by speaking out, this would never happen. This kind of, uh, of event would never happen again. 
But given the toxic brew of racism, of uh, economic deprivation, of misdirected patriotism, and poor leadership that led to our initial internment, I'm concerned that this event in another form might happen again. So I'm, but I'm very encouraged that the next generation, Aaron, your generation, and <clears throat> my my son Dan Sakura, who will be speaking uh, in the next panel discussion, and their involvement in keeping the memory of the internment alive. And uh, Dan had never spoken to me about the internment until late in President Clinton's uh, administration in the last few months. He called me one night and asked me, tell me about the internment. It, it, was, a, it was a shock, but I was happy to talk to him. And he will then relate the story about how he was able to garner political influence within the White House, including John Podesta, who lived on the north side of Chicago and was very aware of the internment story, who was very supportive of, of uh, making Minidoka a national historic site. So I'm guardedly optimistic that our stories will live on and that we will have an impact and that this type of racial discrimination will not happen again. Thanks, David. And I have to say, I mean, we can only do the work that we do to keep sharing your stories because you're you're willing to talk with us and share these memories. Mm. So really, I'm so grateful. And I know so many folks watching along are so grateful for you all, all three of you, um, mm -hmm. for being willing to come on StreamYard and, and share these memories. Um, Joni, I want to ask you the same question of, of when you started sharing these stories, when you started doing some research into your own history um, and what that experience was like for you. Um, I was in college. I went to a small junior college here in Portland, uh, and I had a professor of English and history who came up to me one day and he said, um, Joni, um, how about writing a paper or letting us know about your family's incarceration during World War II. Well, I didn't know very much about this. I knew the word camp and I knew camp stories, but I think my parents were silent people too and they were in denial about the injustices of our incarceration. But doing that paper gave me reason and curiosity to interview my mom and dad. They um, really didn't like talking about camp. They didn't like to talk about their discriminations or their injustices and their losses. And it was a very painful interview that I had with them. But I knew I had to keep going on this. So I went to the public library and I did some research there. I spent days and even evenings at the public library going at that time in 1950s, uh, mid fifties, there was so little written in our books and our text. Uh, we didn't have the technology that kids could sit down and pull it all up on the internet now. So um, I remember going through all the archives and uh, it really bothered me a lot listening or reading about all of this. Um, it's, I was very angry. Uh, there was so much propaganda in the material that I read. Um, we had used microfilm. Do you, do you, do you, it's where you put newspapers on this huge screen. And I remember cranking that thing and reading. And anyway, I, I did a paper and it was pretty well written, I think. Um, it was called Protective Custody. And um, my professor had said, you know, this is just during the time of the civil rights movement. I think this is like late 50s. And uh, he said, Joni, um, I have a group of people that I think would be very much interested in hearing your story. And so um, I said, well, I, I really can't speak. He said, no, just you can read from this. He said, but I'd like you to meet me. And he took me to a church in North Portland. It was a very large African-American church. It was the Vancouver, I think, Vancouver Avenue Baptist Church. Um, but anyway, 
um, the only time I had ever spoken was in our classroom, but I had never done any public speaking and we went into the church. And um, I remember getting on the podium and I was so nervous and so scared. My voice was just shaking. I was only 19. <laughs> but anyway, after I spoke to the congregation, I felt like my parents, all their silence had been broken at that moment mm -hmm. because I was able to talk about their story, basically mm -hmm. their story and all the bigotry and the injustices that were done to them. Mm -hmm. And it was a moment that I felt a very deep connection with the Black community. This was a very important time in my life, I think. Years had passed, and, you know, I got married, moved to Hawaii, and had children. I was busy as a mother and as a person that had, we had our own business. And but about 15 years ago, my youngest granddaughter lives who lived in Roseburg, Oregon, had asked my late husband and I if we would mind coming to her high school and talking about our experiences. And Jim was from Hawaii, and he had an experience of actually uh, witnessing one of the kamikaze planes that came over his yeah. house um, bombing Kaneohe Air Base, which is right next door and they they flew low and he was able to witness all of that so that was a really mm -hmm. interesting story from his viewpoint in hawaii and then i talked about my story and i remember the kids were just very they were so interested in this and they had such good questions but i also found out from talking to their teacher that there were only two sentences in their history books about what happened to us mm -hmm. I knew that somehow later in life that I would have to have an opportunity to share. I, I was just shocked at how it was not that the, the importance of sharing our Minidoka story was with racial bigotry and injustices had to be talked about. And about a few years ago, um, I was a guest panelist at the Muslim Education Trust here in Portland. And this discussion was with other women from the Muslim, the Jewish, the Black, and the Hispanic communities. And it was about our beloved community. And this was just about the time of the Never Again movement. And I, it's like a light bulb went out in my mind about the importance of of all the history being repeated again. You know, we were faced at that time, the vetting of the Muslims and the hate crimes against the Jewish community, the human, the human rights uh, issues and the border separation of children, Black Lives Matter. All of that was so important to me because it was so in line with history being repeated again. And it all resonated with me. And I think like David and Paul, there's, we're our, as survivors, you know, there are a few of us and we're, we are so socially responsible to speak out and especially to the young people. And they are our future. <laughs> you are our future, Aaron. <laughs> and um, educating for fighting for what's, for what is absolutely right. Um, we have to, keep talking about this. And I have made presentations to schools and to organizations. And with my docent work, I like to talk to the kids about all this. Um, I, I like to, I am pretty active. I've even marched and I've been in support and solidarity with so many of the other uh, marginalized communities. And I speak out because I believe in all the values of that I've had and my beliefs. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Joni. It's such a wonderful story and so inspirational too. And Paul, I know <laughs> you've also been involved in some of these, some of these marches and all, but maybe you could share with us a little bit about when you started sharing your story. Um, hey, yeah. uh, before I get into the more recent stuff, uh, yeah. the, the only thing that my parents discussed about, the war was that my mother kept all of the indefinite leave cards 
because mm -hmm. in our situation, we were supposed to turn it in. Oh. Oh. I think we lost Rose. you for a moment. <laughs> what yeah. happened? My mother didn't. Oh, man. Well, we made it this far. <laughs> we made yeah. it almost to the end. I'll, I'll wait a few moments until uh, and see if Paul will come back. But um, in the meantime, Joni and David, have have you been back to Minidoka in the years since you left in the 40s? Um, and maybe I think the answer is yes. For both of you, you could share just a few few words about what it was like to go back to return to Minidoka. Well, I, I did go back. Uh... It was on the occasion when uh, our son Dan was the uh, lunchtime speaker. So it was especially uh, gratifying and that uh, Dan could take us around, show us some of the projects, uh, farm in a day and the like. Uh, he's worked very, very hard in terms of uh, conservation of more of the land around uh, around the camp. And, and so it was especially uh, a gratifying experience to go back with Dan to show us what his project was was all about. I, I was struck by the barrenness of of the of the area. I, I, it's hard to believe that over ten thousand people lived in in primitive conditions in, in the middle of the desert. But it it was a, an experience that I'd like to relive again because I know much has progressed in terms of establishing Minidoka as a historical uh, national uh, historical site. Mm -hmm. And also with, with the museum and some, some more of the artifacts, it did bring back some memories of, of the barracks and of the mm -hmm. size of the rooms that we were assigned. And it's hard to believe that a family of five with grandmother could actually survive under those conditions. So. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. that was that was my experience and I'd like to before it gets too late to uh, go back and 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 see what the uh, what Minnetoko now looks like you'll 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 like it it has uh, it, particularly in, in the more recent years it, it and the, of course they now have a museum but they have other things too they have a tower they have the the fencing they have a lot of things they have the baseball park uh, mm -hmm. This is a good time, other than the virus, this is a good time for you to go. Uh, from now yeah. on, it really is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Aaron, I think I got cut out. So, you did. Uh, you did thanks for coming. Can back. I continue my little thing? Okay. Yeah, of course. Well, what, what happened to us is after camp, of course, my parents said almost nothing. Mm -hmm. But one thing that we did, particularly as teenagers and older, was that if we saw another Japanese American person that we didn't know, the first question we would ask is, what camp were you in? Mm -hmm. You know, that was our intro. That was our intro to, you know, like people from California, but well, who knows? But our first thing is that, that was a very common thing we say is mm -hmm. what camp you were in, were you in? Mm -hmm. And then that, that started the, you know, the conversation. And, and, uh, but as far as, uh, you know, our experience in, in 42, 45, um, you know, prompted me to get more involved in, uh, you know, present day things. And and I belong to, you know, to do for uh, solidarity. And so in June of uh, 2019, I, I went to Fort Sill from, you know, from Seattle, Washington to Fort Sill and to demonstrate uh, against the building of a detention center for unaccompanied uh, uh, children. And by the way, do you have that that photo? The, the yes. one there? Could you put yes. that on? We can pull that okay. right up. You yeah, can yeah, there. Oh, um, it's not that. No, it's not that. It's I no think nice photos to see. It's the, the news article one. Both are. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, no, it's not that. Let's see that one. There we okay. go. Okay. Yeah. As you can tell there, uh, I am standing along with uh, five other uh, World War II, you know, uh, prisoners in front of Fort Sill uh, facility, the fort. And as you, you can say, see in the back, it says, welcome. And the fort is behind there. And this was a facility that the federal government was going to build a detention center for children. 
And of course, uh, we went there and I went there and I joined other Japanese Americans to, uh, uh, you know, uh, say that this is not right. OK. And that uh, building any detention centers are not right in this day and age will be closed. Well, when we attempted to just, you know, be in front and make our, you know, pitch, so forth, as you can tell that man, the the soldier, the very tall guy there with his hand pointed out, he was essentially telling us, get the hell out of uh, here. You know, this is a federal facility. And see, we had requested that time to, to do this in front of the fort. And he uh, it, uh, intended to, or he tried to intimidate us to leave, okay, and go somewhere else. So what happened was one of our leaders, uh, Mike Ishii, uh, went to him and said, so what are you going to do if uh, we don't leave? And so that that kind of, he wasn't the, the, the uh, lieutenant colonel was not expecting that. He backed off. By that time, the local police uh, in Lawton, uh, Oklahoma, came over, African-American man, and he essentially told the lieutenant colonel, just back off. Let them make their pitch. They're going to leave right after it, which we did. But it was kind of our, it was our, you know, our Japanese-American largely uh, group. And, and we, our whole goal was to unite with African-Americans, Black Lives Matter, with the uh, American AIM, the American Indian uh, movement, mm -hmm. with the uh, Latino organizations and civil rights organizations. And see, we're talking about Oklahoma. See, Oklahoma is not a blue state, as we know, okay? And so actually, when we were gonna do this, we received uh, threats saying that if we if we come, they're gonna take care of us, okay? And, and, and it was very interesting, in response to that, uh, the uh, organizers of AIM, the Indian group, said that uh, since we cannot depend upon the government to protect us, what happened is they recruited very large American Indian guys to come and protect us. Mm -hmm. They actually came from Oklahoma and from Texas. And while we held our demonstration, you know, after, after that scene, we actually had a, a rally after that. They actually did perimeter, yeah. and many of them were former soldiers, and they actually protected us from any kind of outside, you know, uh, hassling. And as a result, there were no signs of, of these people who said that they were going to hurt us mm -hmm. because they don't want us there. Mm -hmm. but, the, 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 but the nice thing about this is after our demonstration, one week after our demonstration, the uh, state of backed off on, on building the detention center, okay? But see, this thing started a lot of things. And from this, I mean, you know, we have a lot of more people now active, you know, particularly your generation. Mm -hmm. We have a lot more people, not just Asians, you know, every possible Asians, uh, you know, every other thing. And, and the nice thing is, uh, is it's, a, it's a, a unification of a lot of minority groups and civil rights groups. You know, which never occurred before, and um, and to tell you the truth, you know, I uh, because I used to get this thing from whites saying, "Paul, uh, your your imprisonment happened uh, almost eighty years ago. Get over it." Okay. Well, the thing obviously is, we look the the present people look different from us. Okay, they're not Japanese; they're Latinos. Okay, but the thing here is our government. Our white America is doing the same thing today as they did to us in the 40s, you know, and that can't be. I'm going to stand for that. And so the thing here is, and of course, with the new administration, obviously, it's it's going to be more positive. But the thing here is, is that, you know, it's to me, it's very refreshing that Asian Americans, huh? Could start this and 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 now you know it, it snowballed. I mean, we we have a, you know we have support from all the Asian groups and a lot of others too. A lot of whites, a lot of you know African Americans, a lot of, of Indians, a lot of you know of, of a lot of Latinos. And I think is that you know uh, uh, 
they have to know of what happened to us. You know, the injustices that we experienced and all they said was in that time, oh, you, your constitutional rights have been suspended temporarily or temper or whatever it was. OK, right. but the thing here is, I think that now with these with, uh, you know, people, your generation and so forth, is that uh, that we have to act. We have to help those that are. See, you, you look at situation is. There are a lot of people who want to become, uh, you know, become American citizens or come to work in America. What other groups, what other white groups do they treat like that? Huh? Those from Canada, those from from Europe, huh? those from Australia, whatever. Are those people while they're processing, are there are their families separated? Are their children separated from their parents? No. They give them a, a, a note saying, come back here on so-and-so date and so-and-so so -and -so time and we'll processing. Goodbye. Okay. And whereas our our government, present government, they they purposely separated children from their parents. At least it's it's more cruel than our time. At least in our situation, in most cases, you know, they kept the families together. They locked us all up, of course, but you know, but they the families were together. Now these people are, are purposely separating the children from their parents. I mean, how cruel can you, you, you be to do that? You have to be you know, some level, an unbelievable level of that. But anyway, that's why uh, you know I belong to the organization. But to me, there is a direct relationship mm -hmm. of what happened to us that is happening today, and we must stop it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you, all three of you. I know we could continue. I would love to continue, um, but we'll have to do a part two maybe at some point. But thank you so much, Joni, David, sure. and Paul, for sharing these stories, but also for the work that you've done throughout the years. I mean, we're able to tell your stories and continue the activist work that you've done because you've already done it. So I just thank you so much for, for that. Um, thank you, folks who joined us. I'm sorry we didn't get to more of your questions, but um, please tune in to the next two panels today. One starting in about 20 minutes um, at noon Pacific time, 1 p.m. Mountain time, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time for me and David on the East Coast here. Um, that's the origin story of the Minidoka National Historic Site. So you'll hear from some of the folks who were really involved in getting this designation for Minidoka. And then after that panel at 2 p.m. Pacific, um, we have the origin story of the Minidoka Pilgrimage Planning Committee. So please join those sessions as well. Thank you so much, Kimiko and both are behind the scenes. Nice meeting you, David. <laughs> nice meeting you, David. Nice to see you again, Joni. Yes, Paul. Bye. Yes. Take mm -hmm. care. Bye, everyone. <laughs>